live there all their lives. That's where they wanted to stay. So there was sort of a cantankerous guy on, lived on Cantor Street. His name was John Saber. He used to sit on his front porch with a shotgun. He said, anybody tries to take my property, I'll shoot him. But eventually, he had to move out. And as time went on, the houses, the buildings disappeared one by one. It was pretty devastating as a kid, you know, knowing that your whole neighborhood was going to get uh, destroyed. And then you, all your friends are gone. It's like rebuilding a whole another chapter in your life. You have to start over. The whole Pole Town controversy and, and you know what happened at Pole Town is that General Motors and the city of Detroit and the city of Hamtramck cut a deal. And in effect, for lack of a better way to say it, sold out a community. domain is when the government takes property by force upon compensation to the owner after due process is given. But today, and this is the shocking thing, a public use means a Costco or a car dealership. Uh, and just compensation means being offered pennies on the dollar. Imagine if it's your property, your life's work. It was literally an, uh, an economic gun to the head of the elected leaders in not only the state of Michigan, but the city of Detroit. The Pole Town Project was a choice between doing something to keep automobile production in the city and preserve jobs, or simply letting it all go and having the industrial base of the city collapse. is an area of Detroit, and uh, actually it got the name Pole Town in the 1880s, when there was the core of the Polish community. One side of the street is Detroit, one side is Hamtramck. So whatever happened in that Pole Town neighborhood that was technically Detroit um, had uh, you know, powerful impacts in the city of Hamtramck as well. The Pole Town Project really was first uh, put forth uh, in the late 1970s, um, roughly 10 years after the 1967 riot in Detroit, uh, which is, was the largest disturbance of the 60s. Uh, the state actually had a 14% unemployment rate at that time, but the city had 18% unemployment, so we had an extremely critical problem that had to be addressed. So Detroit, you know, it, it went through a crisis. I remember walking downtown Woodward Avenue and a lot of the shops were just closed up. The auto companies were under considerable uh, duress because the uh, foreign companies, auto companies, particularly the Japanese, were making substantial inroads in sales of automobiles. And so there was, there was a lot of peril. But the mayor encouraged uh, the chairman of, uh, of General Motors to allow him to identify a site where that production could be relocated. As a mayor, I can understand the, the attraction um, on the part of city officials to, you know, to, I mean, they need to solve a problem, right? They need to solve an economic problem and a, and a blight problem. 
I mean, it's hard to say what I would have done had I been mayor of Hamtramck uh, in 1980. 1981 is when the proposal came up for the creation of the GM Hamtra Detroit Hamtramck assembly plant, which later became known unofficially as Pole Town. And the site that was selected was the site of the Dodge main plant, which straddled uh, Hamtramck and Detroit. Now, when the plant was originally built in 1910, the uh, homes began to be built around the factory fence, around the factory gate. The plant was located on 67 acres, and more than 400 acres was required for the new General Motors manufacturing plant. The city began condemnation of the property using eminent domain uh, available to the city through the Economic Development Corporation. The choice that was faced by the city was either to provide land or not. If it did not provide any space for plants to be relocated, the jobs would be gone. The interest of the public at large is, is what eminent domain is designed to uh, protect or serve. So on average, the homeowners are receiving twice the value of their home when you add the grant, $13,000 plus up to $15,000 to purchase a home elsewhere. In 1980, I uh, began graduate school at uh, Wayne State University in the MFA program in photography. I had heard talk about the uh, city of Detroit taking this land by eminent domain for the GM plant. What I did in Pole Town was mostly cityscape pictures, but I did talk to a lot of people along the way, and there were a lot of people who were upset that they were going to lose their homes. That's all they knew. I mean, they came off the boats from Poland. They moved into a house there that they paid a couple grand for. You know, back then, they stayed there their whole lives. They didn't know anywhere else. They didn't want to go anywhere else. I don't know that people really understand uh, what a, a traumatic time this was, how important it was for us to get this plants to going at that point too. Because with the closing of Dodge Main, we had lost about a quarter of our operating revenue. And we really had nothing on the horizon that was gonna help us. You know, having lived in a neighborhood your whole life and then being forced out, there was this fight against these behemoths, the city of Detroit taking our land and General Motors taking our land for their profit.
Some members of the community were opposed to the project and they challenged the, uh, uh, the authority or the power of the city to take their property for economic development. And uh, that case eventually worked its way up to the Supreme Court in rather quick fashion. decided I was a resident of the city of Detroit. So I was fully aware of the um, interest in retaining GM as a um, employer, manufacturer in the city. It was argued on March 3rd and decided on March 13th, 10 days. I can tell you that most Supreme Courts can't do anything within 10 days because it requires a lot of research, figure out what the state of the law is, somebody has to write an opinion. The general rule in Michigan has been that you can't take property from one private citizen and give them to another. And in the Pole Town case, there was a public necessity, the, the alleviation of unemployment, and the benefits were primarily to the public, increasing the job base or retaining jobs that would be lost, and the, uh, the benefits to the private corporation, General Motors, were only incidental. The acquisition and development costs to, to make this, this site uh, ready for um, the plant was a fifth of a billion dollars, plus 12 years of tax abatement, in return for which GM paid $18 million. Now, that's just background, but it, it, it gives lie to the majority's statements in Pole Town that the benefit to GM was incidental. And it was a tough policy question, but th there was a serious economic crisis, and um, the crisis either needed to be addressed or uh, the city would continue to uh, decline economically. Our major role in this public-private partnership is to provide the proper atmosphere for doing business. That means cutting through the red tape, providing financial leverage, technical assistance, whatever it takes to get the job done. No other city in America tries harder. Take it from me, Detroit means business. This was, and in 1981, this was St. Aubin Street, and it came right down and went right into Pole Town, right here. Now it's, of course, blocked by the General Motors plant. I don't, I don't see a no parking sign, so this should be okay. So this used to be, along here, this used to be St. Aubin Street. So we're parked here now, and we're going to this location. We're standing uh, pretty close to where I took this picture in 1981. There were homes along St. Albans Street. So this row of homes would have been right here. But you can see here, this is I-94, the Edsel Ford Freeway in the background. And farther down, farther east on Tromley was the uh, Immaculate Conception Church. And that was sort of the center of, the, of a lot of the resistance to the to the uh, taking of the of the area by uh, the city of Detroit for the General Motors plant. 
Israelites. And there was a priest, Father Joseph Karashevitz, and he fought the, the archdiocese. You know, he, he, wanted to, he wanted to save his parish and, and all the older people that lived around there that had gone to that church all their lives, you know, it was in vain. They eventually lost the fight. Homes here and they're gone now. So the question is, what would have happened to Paul Town? Approaching the Ivanhoe. So here we are. Been. We've been here since 1909, and uh, we're hoping to stay. <laughs> That's about 1909. Yes, sir. The Dodge Main opened in 1910, and it didn't so last. That was, long. <laughs> it was there 70 years. Yes. 1980. So this was 81. You can see they're up here. They're putting a cinch. They're going to remove the cross, and with the with all the protests, a lot of them were centered around this church. And a lot of the parishioners went into the basement and locked themselves in the basement. And the police had to break down the door and haul them out. And then five days later, uh, there was nothing left of the church. Now that's, you know, houses burned. It's yeah, a lot, of a lot of houses burned. Yeah, yeah. a lot of arts. You know, they were all houses. And then it got down to the end in October and November when there were just that was actually Bulldozing. the last row of houses left. Yeah. Eminent domain, whether it be right or whether it be wrong, uh, sometimes it's it's the best thing to do, but other times it's the worst thing to do because you're tearing up a neighborhood, you're tearing up people who've grown together and know each other. And they lose, I mean, people just lose because they're, they're all spread out all over the areas. Is it a good thing? It can be if it's done properly and used properly. My view at the time of the Paul Town case was given the circumstances that the city faced, that it was, the, it was a difficult decision, but it was the right decision, and the law permitted it to be done. A lot of people think a judge's job is to do fairness. On the court saying, my job isn't to do fairness. It's to do justice under law. I think what we saw there were five justices who felt 
this was really, really important. Because if they said no, GM might actually not use its enormous economic power and buy the property, or it might decamp and move to a greenfield in a suburb or in another uh, state entirely. Well, I think Detroit's handling of the Central Industrial Park project was really superb. They brought together literally hundreds of the little agencies, communities, all involved, all the people from the various parts of government, did it all together, well coordinated. They did it on time and did it within their budget. And I guess that's the thing that appeals to me as a businessman, to see a city government that can really deliver. Hathcock case uh, essentially uh, takes place with respect to a project that was adjacent to uh, the Detroit Metropolitan Airport. Detroit Metropolitan Airport is in the suburbs, 15 miles from the center of the city. And uh, it was expanding in the size of its footprint. And so Wayne County used the power of eminent domain uh, to take the property that, uh, of landowners who had, uh, were unwilling to sell. And they, they challenged uh, the, uh, the authority of Wayne County to uh, take their property uh, on, under, the, uh, under the state constitution of 1963, which was the constitution under which the Pole Town case was decided in 1981. The case worked its way to the Michigan Supreme Court. Uh, the case was originally County of Wayne versus Hathcock. As I was the author, of the Hathcock decision that overruled the Poletown decision. The court, until Gregory, the plurality of uh, Gregory, had always sort of respected that there is a, a, a much narrower zone of acceptable public uses. Well, I, and and Poletown represents a quantum leap, a, a divorcing of, of that notion of use entirely. Immediately after Hathcock, the citizens of Michigan being fearful, perhaps that they'd get another Pole Town court in place, uh, enacted uh, an amendment to the, to the takings clause that became effective in November of 2006, and it says public use, still there, does not include the taking of private property for the transfer to a private entity for the purpose of economic development or enhancement of tax revenues. You know, I think for me, there are a few lessons. I mean, one is that, that these questions are complicated. There may be no right answer, but in the final analysis, I guess, as a, as a city official, I have to put more weight on the human impact. You can't, you know, chase after some, you know, pie in the sky, you know, uh, economic savior at the expense of the people of your community. Eminent domain will help the city and others similarly distressed in the country by allowing it to assemble land, to repurpose land, to increase density, provide for new housing projects, to, to provide for new uh, commercial and industrial projects. If land is this scattered about, even though there's a large amount of it, it, it can't be effectively used. Constitution doesn't care whether you your business is more valuable or not. It only cares whether you're entitled to be secure in your property and that the government can't take it unless it's doing it for public use. One day I drove over to the location and they had put up a fence. And I got out and put my hands up on the, on the chain link fence and looked in and I said, I'm done. This is now private property. 
I got in my car and turned around and went home. That was the last time I went over there. Thank mm -hmm. you.